Good morning, good Sunday morning. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's a joy to be back in the house of the Lord again. Uh, missed you all last week, but we're back. And we thank you for joining us this Sunday morning on Facebook, YouTube. Um, let us have a word of prayer. This morning, our dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to abide with us while we study your word. And as we study your word, help us to be doers of your word. For these and other lessons, we ask in your precious name. Amen. 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 Um, we have had our last lesson last week. We had our last lesson last week in our uh, summer quarter. We are moving over into our fall quarter. Um, so just a few things we hope that you remember from, from the uh, summer quarter. We talked about wisdom. Um, wisdom comes from God. Um, it comes from God. Uh, you can get book knowledge, but wisdom, spiritual wisdom, comes from God. And we are held accountable once we obtain wisdom, and wisdom is truth. So just, just hold on to some things that we, we studied last quarter. So now we're moving over into the fall and into the autumn quarter, and the theme of this quarter is love for one another. Uh, okay, yeah, I know that, that, that shook some, some, some chairs this morning, but love for one another is our our theme this quarter. Uh, God commands us to love one another as he loved us. He commands us to love one another as he loves us. This quarter begins with a widely known story about Joseph that deals with love within Jacob's family. Now, all of you theologians out there, you need to gird up uh, this morning, because we're gonna, you need to pull in some of your 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 biblical history. We are in the book of Genesis, uh, the latter part of the book of Genesis. So we we're getting ready to move over into Exodus, but we're gonna have a couple lessons from this book of Genesis. Unit one um, in this quarter, struggles with love, has four lessons from the book of Genesis revealing aspects of love. Lesson one this morning reveals how a lack of family love devours, it, it passes on into jealousy and destruction. Our subject for this morning is issues of love, issues of love. There are several more topics out there. Uh, lost love, when love is lost, a family at odds, jealousy hurts, and this comes from Genesis, the 37th chapter, verses 2 through 11, tw verses 23 through 24a, and verse 28. So that's Genesis 37th chapter, verses 2 through 11, verses 23 through 24a, and verse 28. So you got your Bibles, you got your commentaries, you got your Sunday school books. So we're ready. Ready. Amen. In 1984, the infamous Tina Turner produced the number one single entitled, What's Love Got to Do With It? What Love Got to Do With It? The song suggests that love is a secondhand emotion and that brokenness is the ultimate fate of the heart. The Christian community, we as believers, we in the Christian community, our response to that question is love has everything, everything to do with it. Love is man's testimony of discipleship. Love is the catalyst that prompted God to sacrifice his son. All of our unique gifts and talents are useless without love. And most importantly, God is love. God is love. Uh, what's the poet said? 
uh, first, first John, fourth chapter, verse eight says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The words of Tina's song, perhaps, are born out of fear. However, as Christians, we recognize that there is no fear in love. 1 John 4.18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. When love is lost, listen to me, students. When love is lost, the center of affection and the driving force of emotions become unbalanced. In our study today, the story of Joseph helps us to understand that love has everything to do with it. So our lesson for this morning, Genesis 37, uh, starting with the second verse. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with his sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Put a pen in that. Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tonic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. Put a pen in that. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph had a dream. Put a pen in that. Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Put another pen in that. I hope you got plenty of pens this morning. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, then, behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. Put a pen in that. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Put a pen in that. Then he dreamed still another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bow down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, and his father kept the matter in mind. Verse 23, so it came to pass. When Joseph had come to his brothers, they, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic the tonic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. Verse 28, the Mennonite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him. They sold their brother to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Our unifying lesson principle for this morning's lesson says that jealousy, hate, and love are emotions that people experience in their families. How do people deal with these emotions? An absence of love for Joseph by his brothers led to envy 
and finally a plot to kill him. Uh, we have three lesson objectives, and we hope that we can uh, see these or uh, study on these once we finish the lesson. The first one is that we examine the circumstances of family love and hatred between Jacob, Israel's son. Now, as you notice, um, Jacob, uh, Jacob's name was later changed, God changed it to Israel. So you, you'll see um, uh, those two words interwining. Uh, the second one is that we repent of time when they allow jealousy and hatred to override a commitment to love. And the third one, develop strategies to allow, allow a commitment to love to override feelings of jealousy and hatred. Our introduction into our lesson, what love got to do with it. There's no trouble, listen to me, there's no trouble like family trouble. It is, after all, the kind of trouble that not even the law of the land can ultimately settle. The law can decide and enforce behavior under threat of penalty, but it cannot make us love one another as we ought. In a book titled The Three Hardest Words in the World to Get Right, notes that there are 11 words people most want to hear when they are near the end of their lives. According to a physician who has been present at the bedside of too many dying patients to number the words they long to hear are, I miss you, thank you, I forgive you, and I love you. If they could hear only one of these statements on their deathbed, according to the author, most people would choose, I love you. Yet in our everyday lives, these are the three words that all too many people find too difficult to say. As the Joseph story begins, everything appears quiet and peaceful. Jacob's older sons have been joined by their younger brother Joseph as they tend to their flocks. An opportunity for companionship, bonding, brotherly love are clearly within the reach of these brothers. Everything seems to be in a place for love. Even though their family seems ideal, just below the surface, just below the surface of this tranquil scene, three of the nastiest of human passions are festering, ready with deadly effects and far-reaching implications to break out into disharmony. These three are Tail bearing, that's a tattletale. Favoritism, that's the practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or a group. And envy. Envy is a feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions or quality. Without love to bind these brothers together, disaster. Listen to me. Disaster seems inevitable. Our ba biblical background, with the introduction of this Joseph story, the writer is moving Israel's ancestral history to a new generation. All the promises of Abraham and the future of Jacob and his clan are now lodged with Joseph. The purposive act is the very thing his brothers are not willing to concede. They don't want to hear it. They do not see the hand of God made manifest in the younger Joseph. Rather, they see a dotting father favoring to excess a son born in his old age. Joseph is now called upon to serve a promise a promise that God made to 
Abraham. He is, his very name, Joseph, means add. He is added to the lineage of Abraham by the mercy of God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. You, you know the story. His father simply agrees early to the will of God with his favoritism of the younger son. The story unfolds without analysis as the dream is born into a hopeless triangle. A hopeless triangle. The boy, the father, and the brothers. The boy chosen by his father and God is younger and therefore not able to do much work. From the beginning, Joseph has been able to get away with everything the older brothers had not been permitted to do. It is easy for them to resent their younger brother, especially when he becomes a tattler. Out of this deep, arbitrary, almost embarrassing devotion, Jacob gives Joseph a special robe. Mm, put a pin in that. A mark of regal status, demonstrating that this son is the wave of the future clearly intending to show that the promise was made to Jacob long ago or still at work in his seed. The brothers in the story are observant and they're sensitive. They are observant and they're sensitive. They see what the writer of the story openly acknowledged. Jacob is partial. Jacob is partial to Joseph. His arbitrary love for his younger son strokes the hatred of the older brothers. Trouble is certain to come in such a triangle of love and hate. Our first outline for this morning, uh, verses two through four, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding a flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhad and the sons of Zelpar, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tonic of many colors, a coat. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. They hated him, and they couldn't even speak peaceably to him. The tensions and grievance driving this story arise from the breakup of the family caused by favoritism, foolishness, jealousy, and deceit. The brokenness in the family eventually leads to separation with Joseph carted off and sold as a servant in Egypt. At the outset, Joseph is portrayed as a faithful son among unfaithful sons. His youth also justifies his assignment to the sons of Bilhad and Zephar the wives of his father, Jacob. Then, verse 2a, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhad and the sons of Zephar, his father's wife, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Mm. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Mm. And think on that a while. Uh, your brother bringing a bad report to your father about your other brothers. Soon we see the first element of tension in the family. Joseph brought their father a bad report about his brothers. <laughs> Some translate this actions as a report about his brother's evil deeds. The writer does not tell us the story, whether it was true or false, all of the words for bad report could indicate gossip, plotting, or misinformation. 
the tattletale report seems to have endeared Joseph to Jacob even more, while equally distancing him from his brothers. Jacob's favoritism for Joseph was on constant display because he was the son of his, of his old age. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his children and made him a long robe with sleeves. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children mm, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tonic of many colors. Predictably, the older brothers hated Joseph and could not speak peaceably to him, verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. But the brothers hated Joseph, not their father. Those who are envious often turn their hatred on the one favorite, not the one who's showing the favoritism. Their hated is so amplified that they can no longer greet their brother in a civilized manner. Wow. The Bible says, Proverbs 14:30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy, but envy rot the bones. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds the evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Our second outline, when dreams cause the vision among loved ones. Verse 5 and 7, 5 through 11, sorry. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Wow. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, then, behold, my sheep arose and stood, also stood upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed, verse 9 says, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and even the 11 stars bow down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The sibling rivalry between Joseph and his brothers continued to escalate in verses 5 through 11. Joseph like in sensitivity or determined to maintain a place of superiority over his brothers, described to them a dream he had had. He told of a harvest time when his brother's sheep bowed down to his sheep. Later, Joseph had a second dream where 11 stars, the sun and the moon, bowed down to him, still seemingly oblivious to their reaction to the previous dream, he told his brothers this dream also. Joe's got to learn. He, he needs to stop telling his brothers everything he dreamed. The emotions of hatred is referenced three times in this section. Such an intense feeling is deep-rooted 
and sufficient motive for murderous intent. Uh -uh. Hatred not only has the capacity to destroy the object of hatred, but it eventually destroys the one doing the hating. It is a no-win situation all around. While the jealousy mentioned in verse 11 is not the same as hatred, it does, not, it does mean one loss of composure in the face of another person's unmerited fortune. Verse 11 said, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept this matter in mind. Jealousy has the capacity to simmer and sour every relationship in which it is allowed to fester. Its only antidote is love, where one lifts others as opposed to fuming over their good fortune. Our third outline, what happens when hate wins? Wow. What happens when hate wins? Verses 23, 24a. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. From the outset, the brothers hate Joseph. Verses 4 through 5 and verse 8. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Three times we are told this, and then we are shown how they feel about him. They smother, verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matters in mind. They recognized an opportunity, verses 18 through 20, but they saw him in the distance. Mm. And before he reached them, mm, they plotted. They plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. They said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. We'll show him. We'll get rid of him. And they finally seize upon it and act. They finally seized upon all of this bill up, and they acted up on it, verses 22 through 23. Don't shed any blood. Throw him in the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ordinary robe he was wearing. Their hatred is provoked by their father's love for Joseph and demonstrations of that love towards their younger brother. This combination of resentment leads them to seize their opportunity to rid themselves of this bragging, tattling favorite child. Away from their father's house, Pastoring in the flock, the flock in the fairway of Dothan, they finally see the opportunity to have their way with their younger brother. There is no indication in this passage that anyone sought love's higher ground. None of the brothers, including Joseph, reached out to the other in a spirit of forgiveness, hoping to keep the situation from getting worse. In the absence of common sense, feeling of resentment and anger can fester. The thing the brothers saw as representing their father's favoritism, Joseph's coat of many colors, 
is the thing they stripped from him first. Why did the coat arouse such rage? In the minds of his brothers, it had become identified with Joseph's very person. When it was torn off of him, Reuben, the eldest son of Jacob and Leah, could indeed say, the boy is no more. Verses 29 and 30, then Reuben, this is not our lesson, then Reuben returned to the pit. And indeed, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? In the absence of family love and a generous concern for the welfare of one another, the brothers sit and have a meal. <laughs> Get this. The brothers sit, and they had a meal near the pit in which a younger brother is intended to die. Hatred has no shame. <laughs> Hatred has no shame and knows no bounds. And our last outline, what the brothers intended for evil. Get this now. What the brothers intended for evil, God, Jehovah, the king of kings, intended for good. Verse 28. Then midnight traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Having decided against outright murdering Joseph, the older brothers hatched a plan to explain his absence to their would-be grieving father. They lift Joseph out of the pit and sell him to a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt for 20 pieces of silver. Then they take Joseph's special garment and dip it in goat's blood, these some bad boys, to deceive their father, intending to tell him that Joseph was killed by a wild beast. Thus the story of Joseph and the strife he incites come to its sad conclusion. However, what the brothers meant for evil, what the brothers meant for evil, however, what the brothers meant for evil, one more time, however, what the brothers meant for evil, God intended for good. And thank goodness for a God like the God that we serve. Even in evil, God works for good. When human love cannot find a way to reconcile, God's love will. Yet it is not exclusively God's activity. There's no determination here where God fixes things despite our actions. And, you know, sometimes we, we, we think that God's going to move here and move there. Uh, but not the case, not in all cases. Uh, the choice is ours when it comes to reconciliation. God will lay the path of reconciliation before us. God will lay the path there. But in the end, in the end, families must choose to live in harmony with one another. We got to live in harmony with one another. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating lesson. We did a study on, 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 on Jacob and his, 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 his 12 sons. And I tell you, these fellas were some, as we used to say back in the day, old school, these were some boogers. They were some bad boys. Um, but our, our concluding reflection for our lesson Genesis 37 introduces us to Joseph, the major figure of his generation. It also lays before us the major theme of this final part of the book. The themes are not new, but are common to the human situation. Family strife and the elder being supplanted by the younger. 
the unabashed favoring of one son over the other, alienation and estrangement on display in a family's life, and love gone cold with no reconciliation in sight. The theme of dreams is a new feature in the story and marks an important change in the religious atmosphere of this part of the book. God does not openly intervene in the lives of characters, but rather influences people's actions by means of significant dreams or simply by guiding actions they take. He's telling us, don't worry about it. Put your trust in the Lord. The Lord will take care of it. The most crucial theological statement of this final chapter in this family's messy situation are to be found in Genesis, the 50th chapter, verse 20. It says, you intended to harm me. You intended to do me some harm. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God's plans for humanity are carried forward despite human obstacles and encumbrances thrown in our paths. Listen to me. Look at where we are. Look at where we are. Humans may temporarily think they have a position of power or importance. It legally force the purpose of God. But in the end, in the end, redeeming love will find a way. Amen. Amen. Um, we're excited about the, the, the fall quarter. My prayers are that you will study your Bible, study your commentary, study your Sunday school book, and be prepared with to, as we um, get ready to go into next week's lesson next week. Hope you have a glorious Sunday morning. Let's close with a prayer. Our Father, we give you thanks for the blessings of family. We give you thanks for the blessing of family. We ask your forgiveness when we break those strong bonds of love that should bind all families together. Give us a spirit of reconciliation and teach us how to live in peace and harmony with one another. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Next week's lesson, the subject is God rewards obedience, taken from Genesis, the 41st chapter, verses 25 through 33, verses 37 through 40, and verses 50 through 52. One more time. God rewards obedience, Genesis 41. 41st chapter, verses 25 through 33, verses 37 through 40, and 50 through 52. You have a glorious Sunday morning, and by the time you get your coffee and your breakfast uh, ready to be time for our Sunday morning worship, we wish you well. Our prayers are with you. Be safe where you are.